This is the second in a series of studies on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, for the basic Bible course. The book of Exodus is the second book in the Pentateuch, and it tells mostly about the exodus of Israel from Egyptian slavery. This took place somewhere around 1500 or so BC, and um, was um, a definitive experience in the history of Israel. The Exodus story actually begins with the story of Moses, and, um, and uh, most scholars attribute the writing of the book of Exodus to Moses, probably during the 40 years that he took leading the people of Israel on the Exodus. Um, in the story, it is told how the people of Israel had been made slaves in Egypt uh, through no fault of their own. They had gone down there on a visit in all good faith and had assurances from the king that all would be well. But a new king came who uh, didn't know and didn't care about the people of Israel. And so uh, in order to minimize the threat from these foreigners dwelling in his land, he turned them into slaves. And uh, they worked the land and um, made uh, bricks for Pharaoh's building projects and uh, were treated very cruelly, partly because they were very numerous and uh, Pharaoh was actually hoping to kill some of them off. Along that line, he passed a decree that firstborn children, male children, were to be executed. And um, it was only through a miracle that Moses was preserved that his life was in fact saved. Um, he uh, eventually escapes from Egypt, winds up in the wilderness out in the Sinai Peninsula where he is a shepherd and at that point he meets God uh, through an encounter with God at a burning bush in the middle of the desert. Uh, God speaks to him and says, Moses, uh, it's time for my people of Israel to be delivered from slavery and you're the man who's going to do it. I want you to go down to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they may return to the land of their ancestor Abraham and worship me. Moses is reluctant to do this. He feels that he has no skills that will enable him to do this successfully. But he reluctantly agrees to do what God has told him to do, and he goes down to see Pharaoh. Pharaoh, of course, will not allow the people to leave. They are a valuable economic asset and uh, he doesn't want to take any chances. So he denies Moses' request and says there's no way that's going to happen. Moses, in turn, informs him that he, Moses, represents a very powerful god, not like the gods of Egypt, the Nile god, the crocodile god, the cat god, but rather the god Yahweh, the god of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and that if Pharaoh will not allow the people of Israel to go free, he will be sorry uh, because God will send judgments upon him. Pharaoh refuses to listen, and so the plagues begin. One after another, the plagues fall in the land of Egypt, each one more terrible than the last, and uh, the Lord turns up the heat on Pharaoh, and his people cry out and say, Pharaoh, what are you thinking? Let the people go. We're, we're being destroyed here. Interestingly enough, the Jews are protected from these plagues. They fall in the land of Egypt, but not on the piece of Egypt that the Jews have settled in. And um, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation in the New Testament, you recognize that there's a certain kind of analogy here where the plagues fall upon the world in order to convince the world to do the right thing. And the world is unconvinced, but God's people are protected. The final plague is the worst one of all. God says, all right, um, you asked for it. I've tried to be reasonable. I told you that you should obey and let the people go. If you're not going to do it, then you need to know that there are going to be horrible consequences. And the horrible consequences are that a destroying angel will pass through the land of Egypt and the firstborn of every family will die all through the land of Egypt. And um, this great national tragedy will force you to do what I'm telling you to do and let my people out of their slavery so that they can return to their ancestral land and worship me. Pharaoh refuses to listen. He says to Moses, don't 
come before me again, I'll kill you. Moses says, okay. And uh, the plague begins at midnight that night. The destroying angel passes through the land of Egypt. And at each house, the firstborn dies. But God said to Moses, this is going to be uh, limited to the people of Egypt. It will not happen in the land where the Israelites are living. And here's what you are to do. You're to take a lamb and you are to kill the lamb. Take some of the blood from the lamb lamb, and put it on the doorpost of your house. And inside the house, you are to be dressed with your shoes on your feet and your walking stick in your hand, ready to go in an instant, because after this plague, Pharaoh is going to throw you out. And uh, you're to eat the lamb roasted with bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitterness of your captivity in Israel. And everybody who stays in that house will be spared by the destroying angel because when the destroying angel passes over that house, he will see the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And because of that, he will pass over that house and no one there will die. So while the firstborn were dying in all the houses of all the land of Egypt, no one died in the land of occupied by the Israelites because the destroying angel passed over those houses. And that, of course, was the beginning of the Passover festival, which is still celebrated even today, thousands of years later, by every good Jew all around the circle of the earth, celebrating the Passover, commemorating this event. One of the questions, of course, that always comes up in this context is, is it fair of God to kill innocent children? I mean, you know, these are, these are babies, some of them, you know, toddlers, some of them, old teenagers, some of them. Uh, you know, every, I mean, every family has a firstborn. And, uh, you know, how could God do this? I mean, this is a horrible slaughter. And uh, it just seems so unfair. Um, but when you're asking that question, you have to remember the history. Pharaoh had enslaved the people of Israel. They didn't deserve that. Thousands of them had died already in the 400 plus years of their slavery. And thousands more were going to die if Pharaoh had his way. He refused to let them go and return to God. And when God said, "Um, you're resisting me, he said, I don't care. And God said, okay, I'm gonna turn up the heat and turn up the heat and turn up the heat until you do what I say. And Pharaoh basically said, do your worst. I defy you. And so in that context, the um, deaths of the firstborn as a result of the tenth and last plague make a little more sense and can be seen not as the cruel, wanton act of a vengeful, judgmental God, but as um, an act of last resort by a God who is trying desperately to do the right thing for his people. In this, Egypt prefigures the entire world that won't acknowledge God. And God sends warning after warning to this world, our world today, in our century. And he wants desperately for people to listen and to act on what they hear, but they won't do it. And God says, look, this is important. You've got to listen, and they refuse. And God says, there is a final destruction that's coming. It can't be escaped unless you will escape it in my way by turning to me and uh, once again it is the blood of the sacrificial lamb that provides a way of escape so that the destroying angel will pass over those who are protected by the blood from the passover experience the people of israel are led out by moses and they arrive at the shore of the red sea Uh, pharaoh demonstrates that he is still unrepentant even though he's been forced to let the people go and he assembles his army and he chases after the people intending on slaughtering them Uh, but uh, ultimately god works a great miracle and it's pharaoh and his army who are slaughtered instead and once again this prefigures the story of the end of the earth Um, pharaoh represents those who try to destroy god's people uh, at the last day and the story is told in the book of revelation at the end of the bible and um, God miraculously saves them. And again, the book of Revelation um, you know, tells these stories about how God's enemies are so angry that they are irrationally set against him and against his people. But God works in order to provide salvation. The Exodus experience is the defining experience for Israel. Forever after, even today, 
the Jews will look back to the Exodus as a reminder that their God is faithful, that their God delivered them, that their God has power to take care of them. And uh, that moment of the Exodus becomes the moment in which Israel sees its national history as one in, that God has designed and God has blessed. Every year, Jews celebrate the Passover. Um, and um, it is no coincidence that Jesus was crucified on a Passover in Jerusalem, in Israel, about 1,500 years after the first Passover in Egypt. Jesus is in scripture called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the Passover Lamb, the one whose blood saves those who are covered by his blood. On the way, after the, uh, the Red Sea experience, the people pause for a time at Mount Sinai to regroup and refresh. And there at Mount Sinai, they have another pivotal experience that goes down into the historic psyche of the people of Israel. The Mount Sinai experience is about laws. It's God there gives them the moral laws, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The religious laws of Judaism that define the priesthood and the sacrifices and the festivals and the holy days and all the religious rituals. He gives them civil laws that will govern a nation, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and how murderers are to be handled and how to distinguish murder from manslaughter and how to distinguish burglary from armed robbery and all those kinds of things. He also gives them health laws about about what to eat and what not to eat and where to locate the latrines and how to recognize leprosy and all those kinds of things. All of these are summed up in what is usually called the Torah, the divine instruction of God given to his people as a gift of his love and his grace. And the Torah becomes the center of Israel's worship and Israel's faithfulness for the next several thousand years.